What is going on, everyone? And welcome to another episode of the show. I am Nathan Marzian, joined as always by my good friend, Brandon Eckel. And we have a lot to get to. Um, in case you haven't heard, some news went down with our beloved Milwaukee Bucks. It's been about a week since maybe the biggest trade in franchise history. Could be the biggest fr- trade in franchise history. I guess time will mm-hmm. tell. But um, Damon Lillard is a Milwaukee Buck, and that is something we never thought we would be able to say. Um, just an unreal, unreal trade. Still feels not real to me. Like it still is something that every day I wake up and I'm like, that was a dream, right? Like Dame's not a buck. And then you realize, no, he is a buck. Um, I haven't actually, I mean, we talked about it in group chats and stuff, but I don't think I've actually spoken to you about it at all. Um, getting your thoughts on it. What was your first reaction when this trade went down and how have you kind of felt since? Like, just how are you feeling going into the season? I was really hyped and I feel really good going into the season. I mean, <clears throat> I think not a I think a lot of people blamed our offense last year when at times it like really was our defense, you know, giving up like 120 points, you know, to heat continuously, but I think adding Dame and just the amount of things you can do on offense and having a guy, you know, with a new coach that hopefully will bring more of a defensive mind, I think that'll help a lot. Um, and when you're going to be able to score 120, 130 a night, it almost doesn't even matter. So it's also pretty crazy, you know, a few years ago, how happy we were to get Drew. And then now, you know, to tell me a couple years later, we have a championship and we're flipping him for Dame. Just pretty crazy how it came full circle, but I'm really excited. Yeah, we got to obviously give our props to Drew Holiday. Had a fantastic few years here. Elite defender. Helped bring us a title. Great dude. Like, we love Drew Holiday. We're always going to love Drew Holiday, except for when he's playing the Bucs now because he is a member of the Boston Celtics. Um, who hopefully hopefully we can demolish in the playoffs this season. But um, wish Drew the best, obviously. But it's, it's one of those things where you're like, it had to be done. You know, if you're going to get Dame, like, I don't think they were, I don't think they were looking to trade Drew, but once you can get Dame, you got to get Dame. Like that's, mm-hmm. especially when you can just give up Drew, they basically give up Drew Grayson and a first round pick from the Bucks perspective to get Damian Lillard. Like that is a huge steal to me. I was ecstatic. I know it's not ideal that Drew ends up on the Celtics, but this is still a huge win for us. I think our chances of winning the finals have definitely improved from you know, a week, a week and a half ago. So absolutely thrilled. And yeah, I mean, the the obvious thing that jumps out immediately is the Damian is pick and roll and how unstoppable that's going to be and just how those guys are going to work together. And it also now allows Chris to be the third option, which I think is fantastic for him, opens things up for him. He doesn't have to have so much pressure to be that shot creator consistently to always be the guy stepping up when, you know, if Giannis is having a slightly off game or if Giannis is getting double, triple teamed, it doesn't have to be Drew and Chris stepping up who, yes, they're good scorers, but they're not meant to be these 30 point per game scoring type of players. If they need to be, you know, they're, they're just not meant to. And Chris props to him. He's done that several times when he's needed to that whole 2021 playoff run. There were several times he stepped up and put up, you know, 30, 38 points, um, had a couple of huge shots for us down the stretch there, but that's not the ideal role for him. And to now have another 30 point, like true 30 point per game score alongside Giannis, that it's just going to be so hard to stop. And you kind of hit on it where you're like, the defense isn't going to need to be amazing anymore because the offense should be so good that you can just be a, an above average or, you know, above average defensive team. And you're going to be really, really good. They don't need to be elite anymore. They don't need to have no defensive holes because that offense should be humming. That offense should be unbelievable. I want to get your thoughts on who the the fifth starter should be, because that's kind of a topic now. Who who should be the fifth starter? You got obviously Dame, Giannis, Chris, Brooke, but you could go you could go with Pat. You could go with people who voted for Marjan in my poll. Um, Jay Crowder, you could put in there. You could put in Malik Beasley if you felt like it. Who do you think? Um, to me, I think it comes down to Pat and Marjan. Um, not just because they've been on the team. Why you don't you don't like either of those I, two? Look, no, no, I like Pat. I don't. I don't know how Marjan starting helps either the team or his development. Um, I think my thought just would be I like the idea of having him. I don't. I'm not saying I just want him sitting in the corner, but a little bit more like the 
you know, spot up in the corner, a slasher cutting baseline, you know, for passes, whatever, and an athletic wing defender to help out there. Now, with that said, I've been a, a Pat supporter defensively. I think his defense is actually pretty underrated. I think he stays in front of guys as good as a lot of guys, you know, even like a PJ Tucker, he might not be as feisty as Tucker was, but he stays in front of guys. He makes them either beat him off the dribble or hit pull-ups with a hand in the face. We saw him, you know, guard KD multiple times like that. And um, I I like the idea, obviously, like, you know, Pat just being a spot-up shooter, but it'd be nice to have, you know, Pat off the bench with um, campaign. And then you got Crowder, you got Bobby. So I just think it mixes it up a little bit better. Also, you know, I'm kind of looking at it that way. Like, do you want a little bit more like the veteran presence off the bench too? But I know what you're saying with Marjan. So, I mean, I think either way, there's going to be kind of the pros and cons of having one of them start. Yeah. My, my ideal thing right now is you start Pat, you kind of know what you're getting from Pat. I feel like that's just a pretty safe guy to put in there. And then you have Bobby off the bench for scoring. You have Malik Beasley off the bench for scoring. You have Marjan able to play with the second unit, getting 20-ish minutes a game with the second unit where he can touch the ball a little bit more. He can develop a little bit more. Um, you got campaign as your backup point guard. So that's how I would roll with it. And if Pat's struggling or, and, or someone else is playing really well off the bench, maybe you can switch things up there. You've also got Jay Crowder off the bench. If his defense looks really good, I want him to be the at least closing guy in that lineup like I would love to ideally he can be that wing stopper he can be like that's what we kind of brought him in to be is he's your wing defender didn't show it last year but who knows maybe he will be a little bit different player this year maybe he will go back to being what we're used to from a a defensive standpoint and if he does I would love to see Dame Chris Jay Giannis Brooke to close out games Mm -hmm. um that I think is ideal I like I said, I'm just not ready to throw Marjan in there. I don't. I know everyone's infatuated with youth. Everyone's infatuated with potential, and like I'm more of the okay. Like he hasn't really shown us that yet, and I know it's just regular season. So who really cares who's starting? If they, you know, if you throw Marjan in there and he struggles, it's okay. It's not going to kill us. But I still just am like I think the best thing for his development wouldn't be to just throw him out there with Dame, Giannis, Brooke, Chris, where he's not really going to touch the ball, and he's just kind of standing in the corner. It's like I don't. I don't think that's the best for him, but I don't know. Um, but back to the the Dame thing real quick. This is going to help in obviously so many ways. We had talked about the pick and roll stuff, but not only that, he's his isolation, he's way better in isolation and just like as a bucket getter late in the clock than anyone we've had in recent memory. Um, it used to be, like I said, kind of Chris being that guy that would kind of bail you out. And it's, again, Chris can do that, but to have Chris be in a position where he has to be that guy isn't ideal. And now you have a guy who's just like a another superstar player that you can count on in those moments. Obviously, we know what he can do in clutch time, which is huge because, again, just with Giannis's play style, Giannis isn't a go give him the ball and go get a bucket type of player in, in crunch time because he's not an outside shooter. He's not a, a perimeter shot creator. But you now have that guy in Dame. And then just the fact that He's someone who can throw an entry pass to Giannis out of the pick and roll, which we haven't really had consistently from a point guard ever with Giannis. It's, I can't believe it took this long to get Giannis like a, a true point guard, you know, to, to, to play with him. Cause Bledsoe was, you know, he's a point guard, but he wasn't really that tight. He, he was a little bit more of a defensive minded and, you know, driving type of point guard rather than like a, an assisting point guard and someone that is like a really good pair for Giannis. Same with Drew. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just a better version of Drew Holiday where he was better at defense. He's a little bit better at everything offensively, but still was not the best at just being a pure point guard. And now you finally have that in Dame. You finally have someone that is just going to be able to throw entry passes to Giannis, play off of Giannis in the pick and roll. And it's just going to be such a fun pairing. Um, and lastly, his ability, I, I tweeted about his ability to get to the line. The Bucks, even with Giannis, who obviously gets the line more than anyone in the league, the Bucks were still 20th in free throw attempts um, in, in the last few years. And Dame is one of the best in the whole league, not just among guards, in the entire league at getting to the line. I think he averages like 11 free throw attempts per 100 possessions, which I think Drew was at three or four. Um, just being able to get downhill, he's a really he's a really underrated driver to the basket. And I think that'll be huge for us as well is like, he's not just a shooter. He's not someone that just stands on the perimeter, jacks up shots. Like 
he is dynamic with the ball in his hands. And that's something, again, the Bucks have not had from any player, especially their point guards in recent memory. He's not going to turn it over quite as much as Drew. He's just, he. I just think he'll be the perfect offensive player next to Giannis. Defensively, obviously there's some concern there because he's a very, very, very big downgrade from Drew on that end. But I think you can hide it. I think he's good enough, or he at least tries hard enough on that end that it's not going to be a complete liability. And he talked about this in his interview where he's like, I'm not a pushover. Like, I'm not someone that goes out there and just dogs on that end. It also doesn't help that he was playing on a terrible team and had to right. do everything offensively. So he, he he's mentioned that again. He was like, I had to carry a huge load offensively. That's going to affect my defense. So if you can take a little bit of his load off offensively, it should help him a little bit on defense. And he just needs to be a good team defender, be someone who can be in the right spots and not kill you because you've got Giannis, you've got Brooke, you've got Jay Crowder, you've got hopefully a better version, better defensive version of Chris Middleton than we saw last year coming, you know, being healthier. So the Bucks should still be a good defensive team. And real quick, I have a, a stat here. With Drew Holiday off the floor the last three seasons, their defensive rating with him off the floor would have ranked tied for 7th, 13th, and tied for 6th. So it's not like they were terrible defensively when Drew was off the, the court. Mm -hmm. like they're still a good defensive team without him. Um, definitely should be worse. I'm not saying that they're not going to be worse without Drew, but I don't think it's going to be, oh, my goodness, the Bucks can't get any stops. I mean, they, they should be okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, not, you know, you brought up the point of, um, <clears throat> you know, Dame with his defense, and it kind of reminds me of, you know, Chris with having to do more because, you know, back in, I mean, really, I think back to the Easter Conference Finals when we lost to Toronto, and that was really where Chris kind of struggled because he had to do more on defense. And then I think over the years, he learned how to balance it out a little more and, you know, had a little bit less of a workload with Giannis continuing to get better um, and then bringing in, you know, Drew. So, I mean, as you said, that'll be a big help. And having guys like Giannis, <clears throat> Brooke, at least as a rim protector, and then, you know, the Jay Crowders, Pat, possibly Marjan, all those guys that help fill in, you know, defensively, I, th I think will be okay. And um, one other thing is I think Dame gets slept on kind of as like a playmaker. I know you kind of touched on it a little bit and getting downhill. Like I think he averaged about seven assists a game last year, which was as good as Drew. And he was scoring 32 points a game. Now I know, you know, he had the ball in his hands a lot more than, than Drew would as he was the number one guy. But it just shows that he does have that vision. And um, he's a willing passer that can score at an elite level. So I think that's another thing to be excited about. And I just love I love the pairing with Damon Giannis also in that they, they both mentioned it in their in their press conference right away where they're like he feels like a like he like that guy feels like me just a different size you know Dame feels like Giannis is just a bigger version of him and Giannis feels like Dame is just a smaller version of him so it's like neither one of them needs to be the guy neither one of them feels like they 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 have to be the guy it's like we're we're willing to defer to each other and do whatever it takes to win we're both going to work extremely hard we both are like we, we we come from smaller cities where there, they haven't been these big market type of players like they they both just have a lot of similarities that way and i'm just like so confident i'm so confident that's going to work out whereas you see some of these other star duos and star trios get together such as the brooklyn one a couple years ago and that's one where you're like i don't know if they can mesh i don't know how that's going to work even with the mm -hmm. suns this year you're kind of like with beal and booker and kd like how is that all going to work there's only one ball right Whereas this one, it's like it really feels like it should be a pretty seamless um, transition for for both of them, just to be able to to play off of the other and be willing to sacrifice just a little bit to for, for the other person to succeed and for them all to be much much better. So super super excited and just awesome awesome time to be a Bucks fan. Um, transitioning to Packers Raiders Monday night. Packers coming off of a pretty ugly loss to the Lions last week, Thursday. They are now 2-2. Two and two. Um, Jordan Love did not look good at all in the first half. Got it going a little bit in the second half. But mm -hmm. overall, it was, you know, this this whole season's been inconsistent. You know, they played a pretty ugly first half against the Bears and then were really good in the second half against the Bears. They played a really good first three quarters against the Falcons and then choked in the fourth quarter. They then played a really bad first three quarters against the Saints and then came back in the fourth quarter. And then last week it was, you know, kind of a mess. So it has not been consistent. They haven't been able to get into a groove at all. But 
it also is like, okay, every time they look terrible, there's like moments where you're like, okay, never mind, they're actually pretty good. So hard to get a gauge on this team. How right now do you feel about them? Honestly, I'm right at like a, you know, kind of like a five out of 10. I just feel they feel like a very average team with kind of like they have the potential, but you know, and every team has injuries, but especially offensively, they kind of been banged up to start the year. I think this will be a true, this is a good like test game. Like, okay, this is a team that if you're a potential playoff team, you beat by seven to 10 points, you you know, especially on, even though you're on the road, Garoppolo has not been good. So we need the defense to step up. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's about where I'm feeling. They started playing a little better against the Lions, but obviously by that point it was too late. So how are you feeling? This, I'm, I'm in the middle as well. Like, again, it's hard to get a gauge on on love, on the team. On, with the injuries, too, it's just like you don't know exactly how much of it is love's fault. You don't know how much of it's just him being in a bad situation right now with, with the offensive line beaten up, with the Aaron Jones being out, with wide receiver injuries. So this, to me, feels a little bit like a get-right game on both sides of the ball because, you know, offensively, um, the Raiders have the 30th ranked defense in terms of EPA per play allowed. They're terrible against the pass, bad against the run. So it should be one where if Watson's out there, if Jones is out there, if they've got you know their offensive line healthier, Elton Jenkins is back, the, the Packers should have a really good offensive day. Like, And if they don't, it's time to be a little bit worried. Um, but it's, again, kind of that get-right game, kind of that one to show like, okay, no, we're, we're, we're still pretty good. Um, Packers are fifth in pass block win rate. Raiders are 24th in pass rush win win rate. So there shouldn't be too much pressure on love. Like we saw with the lions, you know, lions really got after him. Those injuries on the offensive line did not help. And they showed up and love was kind of just under pressure the whole game. So this is one where he should be comfortable. We should be able to get a good gauge on how he's looking because it, you know, he shouldn't have pressure in his face all the time. So hoping the offense can put up some points. Romeo Dobbs has been kind of the one of the he was the lone bright spot last week. He had nine yeah. catches for ninety five yards, and Love seems to love him. So hopefully he can have a big game. Christian Watson's back. You know, hopefully he can have a, a big game. And then defensively, the Packers obvious uh, the obvious weakness on defense is their inability to stop the run. And the Raiders are dead last right now in rushing efficiency. So. Again, it's kind of a get-right game on that side of the ball, too. Now, I don't necessarily trust them to stop Josh Jacobs because Josh Jacobs is talented, and, again, our defense historically just never can stop the run. So even though even though the Raiders are only averaging like three yards per attempt, I still have a feeling they're going to be able to run on us, and it'll be a very – you know, I don't want that to be the case, but I just – it feels like that's always the case with the, with the Packers. So Yeah. But, but still, it's – it's kind of a get right game for me on both sides of the ball. I think if you should be able to get right your running if if you come to play, you should be able to get right your your run defense with this matchup and you should be able to get right your passing offense with this matchup and hopefully Jones is back and that'll help the whole offense, but this game I I I expect them to win with them coming off injuries having a long long week. I just hope that, you know, both sides can can kind of be consistent for one game. Totally agree. And then now it is time for our week five NFL power rankings. So Brandon, you can kick us off with number 10. All right. We were talking a little before we didn't love, especially the last couple teams, but number 10, I went with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think their defenses look good enough. Baker looks pretty solid so far. So I, I just had to give them the nod over some of the two and two teams that just haven't impressed me enough. Bengals, Chargers, both come to mind. Well, Bengals, I think, are one and three. But yeah, and I mean, I'll I'll just say I left the Bengals off as well, just because of how bad they've looked. Like, there's something seriously wrong there. It was mm-hmm. at first we did this after week three, and it was you know we both had the Bengals on there, and it was like okay, um, they're struggling right now, but they got a couple easier games coming up. Like they should get right, and they haven't. And it's like, I don't, you know, some of it's directly related to Burroughs health, but some of it is also just some, some really bad things going on with them. So hard for me to like put them in my top 10 right now, just with how bad they've looked, even though talent wise, they obviously have it, but I don't have the Buccaneers in here either. Cause when I just, I look at their schedule and I'm like, 
They barely beat the Vikings. Yeah. They beat the Bears by 10. They got destroyed by the Eagles. And then they won kind of an uglier game against the Saints. So nothing super, super, um, I don't know, not, nothing that gives me too much confidence in them in those four games yet. My, But this team also, as you said, none of these teams are, are that good at the bottom here. But I have the Chargers. Their defense sucks. I don't think they're that good. But offensively, I at least think they're good enough to give me some level of confidence in them. But the coaching is not good. The defense, as I said, is terrible. Mike Williams is done for the year. Um, I don't know. I, I After, like, the seven, eight teams, there's a bunch of kind of just mediocre crap, and then there's, like, the really bad teams after that. Mm-hmm. But there's just not a ton of teams that give you a whole whole lot of excitement. It feels like a lot of just meh teams. I mean, the Chargers – um, lost to the Dolphins by two, not a bad loss, but then lost to the Titans, barely beat the Vikings, and barely beat the Raiders. So it's it's an ugly pick, but again, I, I at least trust their offense a little bit. Yeah, that's fair. Um, coming in at nine, I got the Seattle Seahawks. Um, Geno Smith has looked pretty solid, you know, serviceable quarterback, especially compared to some of the other options on teams this year. Um, defenses look good enough. I really like their running game with Kenneth Walker. So, yeah, that's my pick at nine as well. I think, I think they're pretty good. I mean, I don't. They don't seem like a threat to make the Super Bowl or anything to me, but they are a, definitely a, a a solid good team. Like I, I think they're worthy of being in the top ten. And then I'll go at number eight. I have Detroit, a team that I did not have in my top ten the last time we did this, but. You know, they, they completely stomped the Packers, which was pretty impressive. And their defense looks good. They have a good pass rush. Dave Montgomery looks like a beast. So, yeah, I mean, they, they do look pretty good. So I think on both sides of the ball, they're a pretty balanced team, and I'm willing to give them a uh, a top eight spot here. All right, number eight, I went with Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, I just I don't love their offense. I, I always am a little bit leery of them. Obviously, they depend on Lamar running a lot, which scares me, so not much more to be said. Still a uh, contender. Yeah, that's my seven. Um, I like their defense, as you said. And, yeah, it, it, Lamar has been kind of inconsistent, and the running game is now kind of a struggle with J.K. Dobbins being out. But I, I think they're still – they're a – potential like AFC championship team you know mm-hmm. I, I could see them in there I could see them knocking off one of the higher AFC teams in a playoff game not not yeah. that I would necessarily pick it to happen but I could definitely see it happening yeah. so that was my my number seven was the Ravens okay and then I got mine flipped so I got the Lions at number seven um I don't know I just I like them a little bit more I like their feistiness I really like their offense I don't like golf on the road that's the only thing so my six is a team that dropped a little bit from last week or last time we did this, the Dolphins. That absolute shellacking they took against the Bills was kind of a uh, a statement game, I think, for both teams. Mm-hmm. And the Bills showed that, like, hey, our offense is legit. We might be the team to beat in the AFC. And the Dolphins kind of showed that, hey, like, our, de- our defense is bad enough to give worry. And, you know, our offense can't always keep up. So... Um, still think they're a very good team. Still think that they can beat anyone in the league, but it definitely was one of those like, okay, maybe they, maybe we need to pump the brakes a little bit and move them down just a, a, a tad. But I still think they're one of the better teams in the league. Number six, I got Dallas. Um, <clears throat> I just, I like Miami a little bit more, especially because Miami obviously was coming off the whatever they won, seventy to thirty or whatever against Denver. So just kind of one of those spots where it's like they scored so much the previous week. And then having to go up against Buffalo is tough. But all right, you start the top five. So then top so in five I got right there, Miami. The same races as you said, super explosive offense and um probably my favorite team to watch this year. So my five is another team that dropped a little bit, the Eagles. They had wow. an ugly first they had an ugly first couple of weeks, but I was willing to be like, okay, you know, they're still I think I had them third. But it's still kind of continued. Like they still haven't looked that good. Mm -hmm. Um, Their offense doesn't look fantastic. Their defense hasn't been as good as I think people expected. I mean, they gave up 31 to the commanders. They gave up 28 to the Vikings. So 
I don't know. It, it still has been ugly. I still think they're really good, and I just kind of trust them to grind out games. But I'm not. I just haven't been impressed by them so far. I mean, they're four and zero, but none of their wins have been super impressive to the point of being like, okay, this is this team looks like they are gonna. They're on the same level as the Niners. Like they just seem like a team that grinds out wins. Mm-hmm. Um, I got KC at number four. Um, getting you know more confidence in them. Obviously, Mahomes I trust more than anybody, and their defense looks pretty legit this year. So, I have them at four as well. Yeah, defense looks really good. They're actually one of two, sorry, three teams to be top five in both offensive and defensive EPA per play. No, two teams. There's only two teams. So oh. it's yeah that that. That kind of I like when teams have balance like that, and obviously when you have balance with the best quarterback in the league, that is a pretty good combination to have. So yeah. that defense, that defense combined with having Mahomes and Kelsey, you know, obviously they're going to probably be one of the one of the last teams standing. So yeah. Okay, number three. That's where I got the Eagles coming in. Um, I still got them three. I I totally agree with what you're saying. Obviously, they really haven't looked that good, but. On the flip side, it's the point of also like they've been finding ways to win with not being great. Um, but obviously, power ranking wise, you know they have some room for improvement. So number even three, team, what was that last part you said? Just like you said, even as a four and old team, like it's crazy to say like, oh, they haven't been that good. You know, like on one side they're finding ways to win games, and but on the other side they don't look great. So my number three is the Cowboys. And I just love their defense so much. I know they had that one weird game where the Cardinals kind of destroyed them, but the Cardinals actually have been competitive this year. That that they have been pretty good. They hung with the Niners last week, so it doesn't. It's not as bad as it kind of originally looked. But they destroyed the other three games. They have won. Let's see. Let's do our math here. One hundred and eight to thirteen. So. Wow. That's I mean, I know they've played against Patriots, Jets, Giants, but still, like they have completely dominated those three games. And so I think their offense is good enough to win a ton of games with how good their defense is. And yeah, so I'm 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 still a believer in them, even with that with that Cardinals loss. I I don't think it's anything that moves them too far down my board. Yeah, and even especially just one other thing with them is like as bad as those teams have been this year, those are three teams that you know, on the defensive side of the ball, you know, that's kind of more of their sticking point, at least suggesting yeah. the Patriots especially. So. And they put up, they put up in the, like those three games, 40, 30, and 38. So yeah, that's a great sign. Um, number two, I got the Buffalo Bills. <clears throat> Obviously that weird week one against the Jets and have just looked awesome since then. They're scoring at will, their defense is stepping up. They're just a very good team, so. And we, yeah, so we have the same top two. We have Bills number two, Niners number one. And yeah, that Bills, I mean, they, I probably had them six or seven in week three because they started with that ugly loss in week one to the Jets. And Josh Allen turned the ball over a ton, turned it around, had a really good week two, but it was against the Raiders. So you couldn't really tell, um, you know, just, just how good they were. But they have responded. And that Dolphins game was definitely huge in kind of getting people back on the Bills train and, and realizing, like, yeah, this team is, very, very, very good. They just destroyed the Dolphins, and Josh Allen looks like an MVP candidate again. Diggs is amazing. That defense is good. So, yeah, they're they're right up there. And then, of course, the Niners, it's the Christian McCaffrey show, and their defense is awesome. It feels like McCaffrey just gets 10 yards every time he touches the ball. Yeah, it does. I, I don't know how – I don't know why he isn't higher in MVP odds because none of the quarterbacks have been, like, super impressive. And – he just is like a one man like wrecking crew out there. It's insane. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I I like to me, I like if I had an MVP vote right now, I would probably vote for him. Yeah, I I think I'd agree. I, I'm just pulling up Purdy stats quick because I was gonna ask you your opinion on Purdy. And I mean he's been good, but he's you know, he's just been a guy that, you know, hey, just make the passes we need. Don't do anything crazy, don't turn the ball over. Yeah, um, he's number one, he's number one in QBR, I QBR. know, by like a pretty mm-hmm. wide margin. He's a, and he, and obviously this is partially because of all the running that they do with McCaffrey, but he's only got five touchdowns, you know, no incompletions. Yeah. He doesn't really run the ball for them, which and I'm not hating on the guy. I'm just saying like no, McCaffrey yeah. is really carrying that offense, and that's where the offense starts. Versus obviously, you know, 99 percent of other teams in the league, 
it starts with the quarterback. So Purdy is like kind of the perfect guy. And um, I totally agree. I think McCaffrey should be number one. I think right now probably him and Josh Allen right up there is the top two. Yeah, Purdy is an excellent, like, and this isn't a knock, but he's an excellent game manager. Like, he's perfect for that offense. I think he's smart. He makes the right plays. He's not going to kill him. But he, you know, they, they get a lot of guys open. They have crazy weapons on that team. He's in a perfect situation. But he's been really good at, you know, executing and making the right plays and everything. But, yeah, the offense obviously starts with McCaffrey. And it just, again, as I said, it kind of feels like every time he touches the ball, it's like he's breaking four tackles and getting 12 yards and scoring a touchdown. It's like it's just absolutely nuts. But um, that'll do it for us for this episode. Um, we got Bucks basketball coming soon, NBA coming soon. We got, you know, NFL is, is obviously continuing. So we'll have episodes coming up here on pretty much a weekly basis. Um, thank you all for tuning in and hope to see you guys next time. Peace out.